Welcome to Down to Earth but Heavenly Minded Podcast. Hosted by Irving Rich. The Ephesian Epistle. By James Boyd. Ephesians Chapter 2. Who could have supposed that the ruined state in which we were, as in the old and fallen race of Adam, would have furnished the very occasion of our transfer from Adam to Christ. The first Adam was out of the earth, made of dust, the last Adam is out of heaven, a quickening spirit. The second man gave himself for us, and in his death the old man is ended for us, for it was for us Christ died. And risen from the dead he, that quickening spirit, communicated his own life to us, and in him we live. Thus was the transfer made. And as is the heavenly, Christ, the man out of heaven, such are they also that are heavenly. We are of his order, just as we were of the order of the man made of dust. The two races are according to their respective heads. The works of the fallen do not come in here. The worker here is God. As we have already seen, it is God, rich in mercy and great in love, who has quickened us with the Christ. It was infinite mercy, but the spring of that mercy lay in the love of his heart. It was not like the love bestowed upon his people Israel, which went not beyond his ways with regard to his government of this world. Nor was it just the same as his love manifested in his only begotten Son who died for all, for God desired the salvation of all. And therefore did he by the cross of his Son open up a way of salvation for all. This was love more in the sense of pity. No, this is a love that goes back before his works of old, before the line of time began to be traced, the line upon which all mysteries of eternal counsels are being fulfilled and perfected. He chose us in Christ before the world's foundation. We were the objects of his love then. We cannot suppose that God did not know that Adam would fall, and that we should be fallen with him. Perhaps you say, why, then, did he make him? That is his business, not yours. You say, I am involved in the resultant ruin. You are, but he has made a way of escape from the judgment to which you have made yourself liable on account of your sins. But why did he not make man incapable of failure? His infinite wisdom was concerned in all that he did, and he made man as he pleased, perfect and sinless. Yes, you say, but he fell, and therefore I find myself a sinner, and about to be judged for the deeds done in the body, deeds of which you affirm he disapproves. Where is the justice of that? How can you, who are not yourself just, call God to account because you think you have found injustice with him? Do not forget that you are nothing but a poor weak creature who has no rights at all. You make whatever kind of instrument you think will serve your purpose, and if you find it useless you throw it on the scrap heap, and if you are found fault with you say, Have I no right to do what I will with my own? Oh, you say, the question of right or wrong, justice or injustice, does not enter into my relations with that which is the work of my hands. True, but if you could make a rational being, endowed with faculties such as are common to men, and if you could place this being on the principle of responsibility, with penalties attached for disobedience, would you consider yourself unjust should you attempt to enforce those penalties, if he hearkened to your enemy, and so sought by acts of disobedience to raise himself to your level, denying your lawful authority over him? Especially if at infinite cost you had showed great mercy to him, and opened a way of salvation for him, which he scorned to avail himself of. Would you not consider yourself justified in leaving him to the consequences of his own wicked folly? But apart from all this, the Creator cannot be brought to stand before the judgment seat of the creature. Shall the thing formed say to him who formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay, of the same lump, to make one vessel unto honour, and another unto dishonour? Romans chapter 9 verses 20 to 21. The Creator surely has right to do that which he pleases in his own creation, and woe betide that man who disputes such a right. Should any creature, instead of thankfully accepting God's offer of salvation, continue to stand discussing the wrongness of the ways of God with him, his judgment cannot be other than just. God was in no sense bound to make provision for the safety and happiness of his fallen creature, but he has done this, and we should give him the unfeigned thanks of glad and grateful hearts. Many may murmur against him regarding his dealings with evil men, but what man under heaven would we desire to see established in the place which he occupies of authority and might? Let the best son of Adam that ever lived be endowed with the despotism of the Christ of God, accountable to no other being for the way he uses that power. And the result of his reign would only be seen in the destruction of the world, and the endless misery of all who might be subjected to his rule. What a joy it is to know the living God in his true character, as set before us in Jesus. How completely does the revelation made to us in the Mediator drive all the natural terror from our hearts? How good it is to have to do with such a beneficent and merciful Creator! And how terrible it would have been if we had found Him such a one as ourselves, changeful, cruel, merciless, ruthless! 
but to find him what he is, gracious, merciful, righteous, holy, compassionate, kind, and all this even to the unthankful and the unholy, and the same today as when he gave his only begotten Son to die on our behalf. Oh, the joy and delight of such a contemplation as this! The better we know him the more we love him, nor do we desire him ever to be other than he really is, as set before us in the Son of his love. Forever blessed be his holy name. May both reader and writer become daily better acquainted with him. He is worthy of the whole confidence of our hearts. Well indeed may the writer of this epistle now say, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. No greater exhibition of this grace in its activities toward the sinner is found anywhere in the scriptures than is seen in the conversion of the Apostle Paul. Writing to Timothy, he says, The grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant, with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 14. It has been truly said that for his wicked persecution of those who called on the name of Christ he never forgave himself. God forgave him, oh, how frankly and fully. Not a harsh word grates upon his ear as he lies prone upon the dust of the road. It is, rise, and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people, and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes, and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins, and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me, Acts chapter 26 verses 16 to 18. What marvellous grace! Grace surpassingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. The grace that laid hold of this chief of sinners produced in him the faith and love necessary to his salvation. It was so with regard to these Ephesians, and it is so with all who are taken up out of the ignorance in which we all are by nature. The way in which God works for the salvation of men precludes boasting. God is the worker today. Man never merited anything by his own works except condemnation, for the flesh can produce nothing acceptable to God. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. In our natural state we are our own workmanship, helped on by Satan who works in the children of disobedience. But as in Christ Jesus we are God's workmanship, a new creation in Christ, and are to walk as he walked, and exhibit in our practical lives the beauties and perfections of that heavenly life that was his. And that is now ours by his quickening power. What a privilege! May we see to it that it is a privilege which we heartily embrace consequent upon his setting before them the calling of God, and the place given to them in that calling, along with making known to them the mystery of his will, their inheritance, and his inheritance in the saints. Also the power at work to place them in the position that was theirs before the world was in the purpose of God, he calls upon them to call to mind what they were as Gentiles in the flesh. That at that time they were without Christ, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. We see everything by contrast, and therefore are we reminded of what we were in the flesh, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometime were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. In Christ Jesus. No longer in the flesh. Set up in him, on the platform of resurrection, risen together with him, in his life, all that belonged to the old order as in the first Adam gone in the judgment of the cross. We are privileged to take account of ourselves as new created in him, and in him brought nigh to God. If our distance from God in the flesh was immeasurable, as it surely was, for we were dead in our sins, our nearness to him, as in Christ, is also immeasurable. Being in Christ, our relationship, love, intimacy, can only be measured by his, and our enjoyment of all this is in the power of the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us for this very purpose. What marvellous designs on the part of God are unfolded to us in the Holy Scriptures. What a God is brought into view in the small compass of this sacred volume. What miserable man-made religions and demon-invented gods are all else that would dominate the heart and mind of the creature. Above the level of the fallen fleshly mind they cannot rise, neither have they ever been able to invent one solitary pleasure that lies outside the carnal appetite. Their Elysium is but the glut of fleshly lust, without the penalties and pains that a good conscience, not to say the word of God, attaches to such a bestial career. Of the great principles of righteousness, truth, holiness, and love, men of the world know nothing practically. Righteousness, which has no other meaning in their minds than honesty in their dealings with their fellows, they may seem to appreciate. But their appreciation of it arises mainly from the notion that it is always safest to have their relations with honest people. Even those who make the laws, which are sometimes very good, make them for the obedience of other people, not for their own observance. As to their duty to God, this is altogether ignored. 
If they have any thought of a future existence and of a God to meet, they seem quite content to meet him on the assumption that they have done no one any harm. Their responsibility to God is utterly ignored. Christ as peace is viewed with relation both to believers and to God. He has made both Jew and Gentile one in the body of Christ, so that the Jew is a Jew no longer, but both Jew and Gentile as in Christ are viewed as one new man. Peace therefore has been made with God, and also with all in the body of Christ. The Jew was early placed in the place of privilege by God, and, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, were for himself. The Gentile had no right to them at all. This lifted the Jew above the Gentile, and as he was most unfaithful to the privileges bestowed upon him by God, he was all the more guilty as a transgressor. But in Christ we are not in the flesh, for he has made in himself of the twain one new man, so making peace. The enmity is gone in our relations with God, and with one another. But all this must be viewed in the light of the cross, for by it all that we were in the flesh is gone in the judgment of God, and we are in new relationship with God in Christ. Risen and glorified, and we have also received the Holy Spirit who brings us intelligently into the benefit of all this. Therefore reconciliation has also a double aspect, for both are reconciled unto God and to one another by the cross and in one body. The cross has been the removal from before God of the man after the flesh, and in the risen Christ we have the introduction of a man of another order. And with this man all who are of God are linked up by the Holy Spirit. The old order remains as it was, with this difference, that man as a child of Adam can no longer be in any vital relationship with God. Only in Christ can anyone be recovered from the ruin in which the man after the flesh is found. But light having come into the world in the person of Christ, who gave himself a ransom for all, and thus opened a way of salvation for all, the responsibility of the sinner has been greatly increased. He is responsible to believe the glad tidings, which are preached worldwide to both Jew and Gentile alike, and all who believe, of whatever nation or people they may be, are made one in Christ. All having access by one Spirit to the Father, so that Gentile believers are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens of the saints, and of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone, in whom all the building fitted together increases to a holy temple in the Lord. Great indeed is now the blessing of him who believes. His center and glory is not in a gorgeous temple, to which he brings his offerings that the sons of Aaron may receive at his hand, and with which they may load the altar. A sacrifice which can only serve as a purification for the flesh, and which cannot take away sins, but he is now part of the temple itself, a living stone in that spiritual house. And also a holy priest to draw near to God, and to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ, 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 4-5. When Peter confessed Jesus as the Son of the living God, Jesus said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barhona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Matthew chapter 16 verses 17 to 18. The living stones that enter into the construction of this spiritual edifice are taken out from both Jews and Gentiles, quickened into divine life by the Son of the living God, and by him built into this holy temple, against which the powers of darkness spend their energies in vain. In the construction of this spiritual house no human hand is employed. The builder is Christ, and the whole work is his, he says, I will build my assembly. It is not yet completed, neither is it yet in manifestation. It is now growing and will appear in the day in which the builder shall take to himself his great power, and shall reign. In that day it shall appear as the heavenly Jerusalem. But there is still another, and in this case a manifest circle of blessing to be considered. In whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. It is God's habitation in the Spirit on earth. It is also the pillar and base of the truth. It is the witness of Christ during his absence on high, and it is that which maintains the truth while he is hid in the heavens. It has been proved to be a sad failure. Unlike the Holy Temple, though set up at its beginning in the power of the Holy Spirit, it was committed into the hands of men, and because of this failure results. As it does regarding everything that man has to do with. Paul tells the Corinthians that they were God's building. As a wise architect he had laid the foundation, as far as the Corinthians could be called, God's building. But upon that foundation others were building, and everyone was not careful to use good material. He says, let every man take heed bow he builds thereupon. The work of each has to be made manifest, by the day which is to be revealed in fire, and this shall try the work of all. The foundation is Jesus Christ, and the superstructure must be in harmony with it. A man may build with gold, silver, precious stones, or he may put into the building wood, hay, straw. 
if the work of anyone abide, the builder will receive a reward, if the work of anyone is consumed he shall suffer loss, but be himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. As to the defiler of the temple of God, he shall be destroyed.